As I examined the cane left behind by our visitor, a Penang lawyer with a silver band indicating it was a gift to James Mortimer from the CCH in 1884, Holmes, deducing my actions through reflection in a coffee pot, engaged me in deducing the owner's identity. I suggested Mortimer was a well-regarded country-based doctor, noting the cane's worn state and connecting it to his walking habits and a possible affiliation with a local hunt club. Holmes, first congratulating me, quickly demonstrated the flaws in my logic with his sharper analysis, suggesting the initials CCH hinted at Charing Cross Hospital, indicating our mystery visitor was likely a younger man, possibly a recent house surgeon or house physician, who had now moved to a country practice, rather than the established practitioner I had imagined. I shared my disbelief as Holmes made astute observations from the comfort of his settee, puffing smoke rings into the air. While verifying our visitor's identity from the medical directory, Holmes deduced Dr. Mortimer's character traits from a forgotten walking stick, predicting its owner to be a country doctor. Our assumptions seemed to falter upon meeting Dr. Mortimer, a tall, thin man with keen eyes whom Holmes engaged in conversation about his interests and the reason for his visit. Despite an initial focus on scientific peculiarities, it became clear that Dr. Mortimer sought Holmes's expertise for a serious and extraordinary problem, acknowledging Holmes as a leading expert in his field. During a visit to our residence, Dr. Mortimer presented Holmes and myself with an ancient manuscript related to the Curse of the Baskervilles, dated 1742, and once belonged to Sir Charles Baskerville, a friend and patient of Mortimer's who had recently met a tragic end. Mortimer, seeking Holmes's help, shared a chilling family legend of Hugo Baskerville, a wicked ancestor who, after kidnapping a yeoman's daughter, unleashed a horrific curse by invoking the powers of evil in a monstrous pact, further pursuing her across the moors with his hounds after she escaped. After a bewildering start, the revelers, numbering thirteen, spurred their horses into the dark, moonlit moorlands, chasing the tale of a young maiden pursued by hounds and the infamous Hugo Baskerville on his spectral steed. They soon encountered a shepherd who spoke of a monstrous hound from hell itself. As fear overtook them, they discovered the lifeless bodies of the maiden and Hugo, but more terrifying was the beast that stood over Hugo, tearing at his throat. The scene etched a lasting horror in the survivors, and the legend of the tormenting hound, believed to plague the Baskerville family, was hence solidified. Dr. Mortimer concludes the tale to Holmes, who dismissively equates it to a fairy tale, before progressing to more recent, unsettling events tied to the Baskerville name. The sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville has left the county in mourning. Known for his generosity and plans to improve Baskerville Hall, his death raises many questions. Despite his wealth, Sir Charles lived simply, with his heart condition noted as a cause for concern. His nightly walks ended tragically when he was found dead in the U Alley, leading to speculation and rumors about the circumstances. The coroner's verdict of death from cardiac exhaustion ends the official inquiry, but the arrival of Sir Charles's heir is eagerly awaited to continue his legacy. As Dr. Mortimer shares these facts with Sherlock Holmes, the case intrigues Holmes, who requests more details beyond the public knowledge. Dr. Mortimer, visibly shaken, confided in us a story he kept from the coroner's inquiry to avoid endorsing superstitions and further tarnishing Baskerville Hall's reputation. He shared his observations and interactions with Sir Charles Baskerville, who was profoundly affected by a legend, believing a dreadful fate overhung his family. Sir Charles's increasing anxiety and eerie encounters, especially one involving a large black calf or so it seemed, heightened his fears. On the night of Sir Charles's death, Dr. Mortimer arrived quickly to examine the scene and found footprints not belonging to any human or known animal, but to a gigantic hound, a detail he hesitantly revealed to us, underlining the supernatural elements entwined with the Baskerville curse. In discussing the mysterious circumstances surrounding Sir Charles's death with Dr. Mortimer, Holmes learns of the closed wicket gate near the U Alley and the sole entry through the moor. Despite the lack of distinctive marks by the gate, evidence suggests Sir Charles waited there anxiously. Mortimer reveals local fears of a spectral hound tied to the Baskerville legend, causing terror across the moor. Skeptical of the supernatural but intrigued, Holmes ponders the case's material aspects. Dr. Mortimer seeks Holmes's advice on handling Sir Henry Baskerville, the last heir, concerned by the family curse and the impact on local well-being. In essence, Holmes contemplates whether supernatural forces could harm Sir Henry in London, just as in Devonshire. Dismissing the notion as too local for a devil, Holmes advises Dr. Mortimer to bring Sir Henry to him after meeting him in London, keeping him uninformed till then. Amidst a smoky room the next evening, 
Holmes reveals his day spent in spiritual visit to Devonshire through maps, planning their next moves concerning the mysterious Baskerville Hall and surrounding areas, hinting at the sinister nature of the moor. Reflecting on the case with Sherlock Holmes, we pondered the peculiarities, like the change in footprints and an elderly man's irrational behaviors the night before his departure for London. Our thoughts were interrupted by the arrival of Sir Henry Baskerville and Dr. Mortimer for a scheduled meeting. Sir Henry relayed a distressing experience involving a mysterious letter warning him to stay away from the moor, a letter composed of printed words pasted onto a sheet. Holmes and I were intrigued, realizing the case might be deeper and more dangerous than initially presumed. Upon reviewing a newspaper article about free trade, Holmes swiftly deduced the origin of a mysterious note by comparing words cut out from the paper. Excited by his discovery, he explained to us, Sir Henry Baskerville, Dr. Mortimer, and myself, how the specific selection and arrangement of words indicated both the message's content and its origin. Despite our initial skepticism, Holmes's explanation about the choice of newspaper and the method of cutting the words was enlightening. He pointed out the educational level of the composer and speculated on the haste and possible motives behind the composition of the message, engaging us in a fascinating discussion on the blend of education, intention, and method. Upon analyzing a peculiar letter, Holmes deduces its origin from a hotel near Charing Cross and suspects it's tied to Sir Henry, who's recently arrived in London and faced odd incidents, including the mysterious disappearance of a new boot. The conversation then shifts to the dangers awaiting Sir Henry at Baskerville Hall, stemming from an ominous family legend and recent threats. Despite warnings, Sir Henry insists on claiming his inheritance at Baskerville Hall, seeking time to digest the complex situation before discussing further with Holmes and I over lunch. After our visitors departed, Holmes, transitioning swiftly from contemplation to action, urged we follow Dr. Mortimer and Baskerville on foot, keenly observing our surroundings and the people around us. Despite our efforts to remain discreet, our quarry noticed our pursuit and escaped in a handsome cab, leaving Holmes to lament the missed opportunity and ponder the cleverness of our shadowy adversary. Reflecting on the episode, Holmes plans to harness this setback, brainstorming our next move while acknowledging both the power and the design behind the events unfolding underscoring the depth and complexity of the mystery at hand. Sherlock Holmes instructs me to search for a specific page of the Times among yesterday's waste paper at various locations, offering a strategy and funds for the task. Amid our investigation, we encounter Sir Henry Baskerville, angered over a missing boot, indicative of a deeper mystery at his hotel. Holmes deems the case exceptionally complex, tying it to Sir Henry's uncle's death. Despite confusion over the boot, Holmes sees significance in the intricate case, suggesting various leads may eventually unveil the truth. Our meeting with Sir Henry ends with plans for him to return to Baskerville Hall. Holmes advised on the wisdom of leaving London due to unseen adversaries. Dr. Mortimer revealed being followed, prompting Holmes to investigate Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler, potentially being in London instead of Devonshire. The inheritance of Sir Charles's vast estate, involving several beneficiaries including Dr. Mortimer and a distant cousin, the Desmonds, was discussed. Holmes, unable to leave London for Dartmoor, recommended me as a trusty companion for Sir Henry to ensure his safety and handle the estate's affairs. Overwhelmed but intrigued by the sudden responsibility and adventure, I accepted the role to assist Sir Henry in navigating the complexities surrounding Baskerville Hall. I will come, with pleasure. I responded to Holmes, eager to contribute. As events unfolded, Baskerville's shoe discovery, mysterious telegrams, and an unexpected visit from a cabman claiming Holmes had hired him under disguise all pointed to a complex puzzle. Holmes and I, bemused by our own centrality in the intrigue, prepared to delve deeper. After discussing our failed attempt to gather more information about Sir Henry Baskerville's mysterious follower in London, Holmes emphasizes the challenges awaiting us in Devonshire. He expresses concern for my safety, advising vigilance and caution. As we set off for Devonshire with Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer, Holmes advises me to report facts without bias and keep an eye on everyone around Sir Henry, highlighting the importance of not dismissing any suspects prematurely, including the Barrymores and several local residents. En route, we enjoy the changing landscape, and Sir Henry's excitement for his homeland is palpable. Holmes's parting advice to Sir Henry to avoid the moor at night makes the mission's danger clear. Dr. Mortimer discusses the character and lineage of Sir Charles Baskerville, hinting at the importance of Baskerville Hall to him. As a boy, I had never seen the hall, and everything about the moor was as new to me as to anyone. We caught our first glimpse of the moor through the carriage window, 
a place filled with memories and significance for Sir Charles. Our arrival at a small station marked our entry into the countryside, escorted under the watchful eyes of soldiers looking for an escaped convict named Selden, the Notting Hill murderer. This chilling note added to the already eerie ambiance of the moor, a landscape that held a dark allure for both Sir Charles and me, against a backdrop of mystery and a hint of danger lurking within, as we ventured deeper into the heart of the countryside. As we journeyed to Baskerville Hall, the scenery shifted from fertile landscapes to bleak moorlands. Upon our arrival, Sir Henry Baskerville, the hall's new master, and I were met with the somber sight of the ancient ivy-draped mansion and its modern additions. Despite the hall's grandeur and the warmth of the crackling fire waiting inside, there was an undeniable air of doom that seemed to cling to the estate, echoing Sir Henry's concerns about the ominous nature of his new home. As we settled in, the butler Barrymore mentioned his and his wife's attachment to the late Sir Charles, and their discomfort at staying, hinting at a change in the household due to the new master's arrival. Approaching Baskerville Hall filled me with an uneasy gloom, despite the modern comforts of our rooms. The dining hall, steeped in shadow with its ancestors' portraits, lessened our spirits further, making even Sir Henry remark on the lack of cheer. My first night was restless, disturbed by a mysterious sobbing in the desolate silence, a sound of unmistakable sorrow within the ancient walls. Come morning, the hall's appearance softened in the sunlight, lifting our spirits somewhat. Yet, the haunting nighttime sob, confirmed by both Sir Henry and I, led us to question Barrymore, the butler, who denied any such disturbances. His denial, however, seemed suspect, especially upon noticing Mrs. Barrymore's red, swollen eyes, suggesting she was the source of the nocturnal weeping, though her husband had lied. This added a layer of mystery around Barrymore, already clouded by his connection to Sir Charles's death, pushing me to further investigate to report to Sherlock Holmes. After Sir Henry busied himself with papers, I took a walk to a nearby hamlet, meeting the postmaster, who confirmed a telegram was delivered to the Barrymores, albeit indirectly through Mrs. Barrymore, as Mr. Barrymore was reportedly in the loft. My investigations seemed futile, leading to no solid evidence against Barrymore possibly being in London. Amid these ponderings on the motives behind persecuting the Baskerville family, and the complexities surrounding Sir Charles's death, I encountered Mr. Stapleton, a naturalist, who introduced himself and discussed Sir Charles's superstitious fears and his tragic end. Stapleton questioned Sherlock Holmes's involvement, which I cautiously acknowledged without divulging Holmes's current engagement with the case. During our walk across the moor to Merripit House, Stapleton shared his extensive knowledge of the terrain, highlighting the dangerous Grimpen Mire and its deadly charm. He warned me sternly against attempting to explore it, mentioning the rare plants and butterflies on islands amidst the mire, accessible only through perilous paths he had discovered. Our conversation then shifted to a haunting moan over the moor, which Stapleton suggested might be the legendary Hound of the Baskervilles. Though skeptical, I couldn't deny the eerie atmosphere of the moor, intensified by Stapleton's explanations of the natural and supernatural elements that contribute to its mysteriousness. As we walked on the moor, Stapleton explained the ancient dwellings and the lifestyle of its prehistoric inhabitants. Suddenly, he dashed off after a moth, illustrating his obsession with the natural world. In his absence, I met a striking woman, Miss Stapleton, who urgently warned me to leave the moor and return to London for my own safety, without explaining why. Her warning was interrupted by her brother's return, who mistook me for Sir Henry Baskerville. The brief encounter was filled with tension and undercurrents of unsaid things. Stapleton then led us to Merripit House, a grim dwelling on the moor, where the contrast between the bleak surroundings and the occupant's refinement was stark. Despite claiming happiness, there was a palpable sense of unease in the air. While discussing the enjoyable aspects of his previous role and current pursuits in botany and zoology with me, Stapleton mentioned an epidemic that led to the school's closure and his move. His sister also shared their engagement with nature and neighbors, including their fond memories of Sir Charles and intentions to welcome Sir Henry. Despite my intrigue in Stapleton's collection, the Moor's melancholy and a warning from Miss Stapleton hurried me back. She intercepted me to retract a mistaken caution meant for Sir Henry, fearing the family curse and the notorious hound. Despite her insistence on its triviality, I sensed genuine concern for Sir Henry's safety. Resolved but with lingering unease, I continued to Baskerville Hall, pondering the shadows surrounding us and the cryptic warnings given. In my letters to Sherlock Holmes, I detail the eerie atmosphere of Baskerville Hall and the moor, along with our concerns about Sir Henry's safety and the escaped convict's presence. Our days are filled with curiosity and unease, especially considering the convict's disappearance 
and our growing worry for the isolated Stapletons. Sir Henry's evident interest in the Stapleton sister adds a personal dimension to our intrigue. Amidst the desolate beauty and ancient remnants that characterize our surroundings, our investigation into the local legends and the supernatural continues, with Stapleton sharing tales that only deepen the mystery. During a lunch at Meripit House, Sir Henry met Miss Stapleton, sparking mutual attraction, much to her brother's displeasure. Our interactions with the Stapletons increased, despite Stapleton's efforts to limit their intimacy. Dr. Mortimer shared his archaeological finds, while we speculated on the eerie affairs of the moor, including scares that have led to death from sheer terror. I've also met Mr. Franklin, a litigious yet affable neighbor. Amidst these developments, we tested Barrymore's presence at Baskerville Hall through a telegram, which brought to light the Barrymore's honesty and Sir Henry's continued trust in them. My interest in Mrs. Barrymore's evident distress heightened upon observing Barrymore's secretive night actions. Despite her stoic appearance, her emotional turmoil hinted at deeper mysteries within Baskerville Hall. One night, aroused by his stealthy footsteps, I discovered Barrymore peering out a window into the moor, an action laden with expectation and secrecy. His subsequent actions and the specific interest in this moorview window suggested a hidden agenda, either personal or sinister. Sharing my suspicions with Sir Henry, we decided that closer observation of Barrymore might unveil the hall's concealed dramas. As we prepared for an adventure, contemplating renovations and Sir Henry's infatuated yet troubled courtship with Miss Stapleton, I found myself conflicted by Holmes's directive to never leave Sir Henry alone on the moor. Spurred by duty and concern, I followed him discreetly only to witness a tense and mysterious encounter with Miss Stapleton and her brother, Stapleton, who interrupted their intimate conversation with evident displeasure. Witnessing this without Sir Henry's knowledge weighed heavily on me, especially as Sir Henry walked back in dejection after the confrontation, leaving me to ponder the complex feelings and duties entangled in our quest. Upon my unexpected reunion with Sherlock Holmes, I recounted my journey and observations. Holmes, initially angered by my presence, soon found humor in the situation, despite his failed romantic endeavor witnessed by myself and the lady's protective brother. Holmes questioned his own suitability as a spouse and expressed his bafflement over the brother's aggressive rejection of his courtship. Our perplexity was somewhat alleviated later when the brother, Stapleton, extended apologies and a dinner invitation as a peace offering. Stapleton attributed his outburst to the fear of losing his sister, who was central to his life, confessing his overreaction upon realizing her potential departure through marriage. In solving one of our smaller mysteries, we discovered why Stapleton was against his sister marrying Sir Henry. In doing so, I also unraveled the enigma of nightly sobs, Mrs. Barrymore's tear-stained face, and the butler's secretive treks. Over two nights, Sir Henry and I, determined yet initially unsuccessful, set a vigilant watch. On the second night, we stealthily followed Barrymore, leading to his confrontation and the revelation of a secret signal through a lighted window, an operation curtailed by his refusal to divulge more, resulting in his resignation under duress. Yet, it was the intervention of Mrs. Barrymore, overwhelmed by guilt, that revealed the conspiracy ultimately aimed not at harm but bound by a desperate motive. Barrymore revealed the light signals were for his escaped convict brother Selden, hiding on the moor to avoid capture. Despite his criminal actions, his sister, Mrs. Barrymore, saw him as the boy she once cared for, driving them to aid him secretly. Sir Henry, initially angered, understood their predicament and reevaluated his judgment. Later, as Dr. Watson and Sir Henry contemplated capturing Selden for the community's safety, they were unsettled by a mysterious, terrifying cry on the moor, which locals attributed to the legendary Hound of the Baskervilles, deepening the night's ominous atmosphere. It was the cry of a hound, he declared, deeply unsettled by the sound that seemed to emanate from the direction of the Grimpen Mere. Despite Stapleton's suggestion of a strange bird, Fear crept into his voice as he contemplated the reality of the spectral hound tales amidst the desolate moor. My attempts to reassure him felt hollow against the eerie backdrop. As we navigated the treacherous terrain by the faint guide of a distant light, the sight of an ominous figure on a tour illuminated momentarily by the moon heightened our sense of dread. Our pursuit of the convict was dwarfed by the enigma of the moor's haunting silhouette, leaving us in a state of heightened alarm and curiosity. After experiencing strange occurrences on the moor and contemplating the mysteries surrounding us, including the sighting of a mysterious stranger and the haunting cries believed to be of a spectral hound, I am determined to uncover the truth behind these events, putting aside the fears and superstitions. Despite Sir Henry's unnerved state from the previous night's adventures, 
and our failure to capture the convict, my focus is undeterred. I decide to keep my plans mostly to myself, aiming not to burden Sir Henry further. Our morning involved a private discussion between Sir Henry and Barrymore, hinting at tensions within the house, all of which deepens my resolve to solve the enigma of the moor and its eerie phenomena, employing my observations and the scarce clues at hand. Barrymore, the butler, reveals his reluctance to have his brother-in-law, a fugitive, pursued by Sir Henry and me. Despite initial anger, he pleads for mercy, assuring Selden's imminent departure to South America. Moved by his distress, we decide against reporting Selden, understanding the implications. Barrymore, grateful, chooses to divulge a crucial clue about Sir Charles's death, a letter from a woman with initials LL, indicating a meeting the night he died. This information, previously withheld to protect reputations, now seems vital. I suggest informing Holmes, hoping it'll illuminate our dark case. After reporting to Holmes, I spent the day contemplating the convicts and mysteries of the moor. My rainy evening walk led me to reflect on those lost or hiding in its vastness, including the man I'd seen the previous night. Dr. Mortimer offered insights into Laura Lyons and a strange daughter involved in our investigation. Despite the bleak weather, our inquiries advanced, revealing the existence of another mysterious man on the moor, further deepening the enigma. I pressed Barrymore for details about his fears, leading to his belief in a brewing danger on the moor tied to the unnatural death of Sir Charles and the mysterious nocturnal noises. Barrymore suspected a stranger lurking on the moor aimed harm at the Baskervilles. Despite his scant sightings, the identity and motives of this gentleman remained unclear, hiding among old stone huts with a boy for errands. My determination to solve this dark mystery deepened. The following day, learning of Mrs. Lyons' meeting with Sir Charles before his death, I decided to question her alone in Coombe Tracy, discovering a striking woman marred by a hardness in her demeanor, hinting at a deeper involvement in the case. In trying to uncover the truth behind Sir Charles's death, I questioned Mrs. Lyons about her letters and meetings with him. She admitted to asking for his help due to her unhappy marriage, insisting on her innocence and that she never met Sir Charles at the time of his death, despite arranging to do so. She claimed her appeal to him was out of desperation for freedom from her husband, and when another helped her, she no longer needed Sir Charles's assistance. Despite her assertions, the depth of her involvement remained unclear. As I pondered over the reluctance of a lady to admit being near Baskerville Hall, suspecting she hid something, my investigation led me back to the moor with its ancient huts as potential hideouts for a mysterious stranger. My determination grew to uncover this person using the sparse clues available, resolving to confront him or wait out his return. Unexpected assistance came in the form of Mr. Franklin, who gleefully shared his legal victories yet hinted at knowing the whereabouts of a sought-after convict by tracking his food source a revelation that piqued my concern and curiosity. Intrigued by the daily sightings of a boy delivering food to a remote location on the moor, I hide my interest from Franklin, who is convinced the boy is aiding a convict. Dismissing Franklin's theory, I focus on tracking the boy myself, believing he may lead me to an unknown person of interest. My observations from Franklin's telescope confirm the boy's secretive behavior. Despite Franklin's insistence on secrecy and his disdain for the police, I set out alone across the moor, following the boy's path to a circle of ancient stone huts, where I discover what seems to be the boy's destination. Approaching cautiously, I find the hut empty, my anticipation of uncovering a secret growing. Upon investigating a desolate hut on the moor, where evidence of prolonged habitation was unmistakable, I discovered a note indicating someone was tracking my movements, which led me to ponder on the identity and intentions of the mysterious individual. My deliberations were interrupted by the familiar, ironic voice of Holmes, revealing himself outside the hut, dispelling my anxieties, and replacing them with relief and astonishment at his unexpected presence and disguise. Our reunion under the deceitful calm of the moor twilight was a poignant mix of emotions, melding the tension of the unknown with the comfort of familiar companionship. I surmised the gentleman had been using the telescope, Holmes, revealing his presence and reasoning, surprised me, explaining his strategy for remaining incognito was for the benefit of our case and my safety. Although upset for being kept in the dark, I understood his reasoning once he praised my efforts and contributions. Our discussion shifted to my visit to Mrs. Laura Lyons, and Holmes suggested her close relationship with Stapleton could be instrumental. To my astonishment, Holmes revealed that Miss Stapleton was actually Stapleton's wife, not his sister a fact key to unraveling Stapleton's deceit and intentions towards Sir Henry. Reflecting on an earlier investigation clue, 
Holmes and I pondered the identity of Stapleton and his connection to Mrs. Laura Lyons amidst the intricacies of planned deceit and potential murder on the moors. As night enveloped us and the inquiry deepened, a harrowing scream pierced the still moorland, propelling us into a frantic search. Guided by the distressing cries, our worst fears materialized upon discovering the lifeless body of Sir Henry Baskerville, tragically clad in the same ruddy tweed suit he donned upon our first encounter. Overcome by despair and horror, the grim realization of our failure to protect him haunted me, vowing vengeance against the merciless perpetrator behind this cold-blooded murder. In our investigation, Holmes and I confronted a tragic mistake on the moor, mistaking the dead body of Selden, the convict, for Sir Henry, due to the convicts wearing Sir Henry's clothes. Holmes speculated the unique presence of the hound, initially meant for Sir Henry, led to Selden's death. The incident unfolded further complexity with the surprise appearance of Stapleton, who feigned ignorance about Selden's death. Amidst the confusion, Holmes and I had to decide hastily how to handle the body, under the looming mystery of Stapleton's involvement and the hound's unexplained release. As Holmes and I discussed the perplexing case on the moor, we pondered over Stapleton's reaction to the death that occurred as a result of his plot, emphasizing his cleverness but contemplating our inability to prove his involvement. Holmes speculated on Stapleton being more cautious or taking desperate measures now that he knew Holmes was on to him. Despite our theories about the supernatural hound, we acknowledged the lack of concrete evidence to present in court. Our hope lay with Mrs. Laura Lyons providing useful information, and Holmes had his own plan. We decided to keep Sir Henry unaware of our true suspicions about the hound for his upcoming dinner with Stapleton. Upon reaching Baskerville Hall, Holmes decided to reveal his presence to Sir Henry, preparing ourselves for the challenges that lay ahead. Sir Henry was eager yet unsurprised by Sherlock Holmes's arrival without luggage. As we filled him in on our experiences, I had the tough task of informing the Barrymores, leading to mixed reactions. Despite a quiet day, Sir Henry mentioned a missed lively evening due to a promise restrained by a message from Stapleton. Holmes humorously remarked about mourning Sir Henry's perceived demise, leading to a conversation about the case's complexity and the necessity for Sir Henry's blind cooperation in solving it. Holmes' sudden distraction by the portrait collection, particularly the image of Hugo Baskerville, showcased his interest in art conflated with the case, speculating on personalities through portraits, especially the benign appearance of the notorious Hugo against his wicked legacy. Holmes cleverly deduced Stapleton's identity and schemes from a portrait, claiming Stapleton as a Baskerville, aiming for the inheritance. Plans were made to catch Stapleton, involving Holmes and I, preparing to leave for London to meet with Mrs. Laura Lyons, despite initially planning to stay in Devonshire. Sir Henry was instructed to stay and walk a safe path across the moor, as part of Holmes's strategic instructions. Despite my confusion and the critical timing, Holmes's laughter and swift actions hinted at his confidence in our impending success. Sherlock Holmes and I were deep into our investigation of Sir Charles Baskerville's death, suspecting foul play involving the Stapletons. Holmes confronted Mrs. Laura Lyons about her withheld information, revealing Stapleton's deception, posing as a single man when he was married. Holmes produced evidence of Stapleton's marriage, prompting Mrs. Lyons to disclose her unwitting involvement in Sir Charles's death. Having been manipulated by Stapleton, she agreed to cooperate fully, convinced of Stapleton's betrayal. As we left her, Holmes mused on the case's progression, confident of solving one of the most sensational crimes of modern times, comparing it to notable cases in history. Lestrade's arrival suggested imminent developments in our investigation. As we ventured towards the climax of our investigation on the moor, Holmes maintained his usual reticence about our plans, casting a shadow of suspense over our final endeavor. Despite the dense atmosphere of anticipation and the heavy London fog we intended to clear from Lestrade's throat with a venture into the crisp Dartmoor air, Holmes's strategy remained a mystery. Our approach to Merripit House was stealthy, under Holmes's directive to minimize our presence. I, tasked with surveying the house, observed Sir Henry and Stapleton, the latter leaving momentarily, only to return from an outhouse with some undisclosed activity inside. Holmes's concern peaked with the encroaching fog, threatening the success of our operation and possibly endangering a life, as our timing became crucial with the night advancing. Under a clear night sky, Holmes and I watched the moor, veiled gradually by a crawling fog, as we waited anxiously for our friend to emerge from the ominous silhouette of the house. The persistent fog threatened to obscure everything, amplifying our impatience and fear, until finally, through the dense whiteness, our friend appeared, looking bewildered under the moonlight. 
but our relief was short-lived when a monstrous coal-black hound, spewing fire from its mouth, emerged from the fog, chasing after him. Paralyzed by horror at the sight, we eventually recovered, firing at the beast, which howled in pain but continued its pursuit. Holmes's exceptional speed and timely shots incapacitated the beast, saving our friend who lay shocked, questioning the nightmare he'd just survived. Holmes assured him the family ghost was now laid to rest forever. Before us lay a monstrous creature, a mixture between a bloodhound and mastiff, huge and savage, dead yet still emitting a bluish phosphorus glow that made my fingers gleam in the dark. Holmes identified the substance and apologized to Sir Henry for the ordeal, attributing his survival to our timely intervention. However, we had to leave Sir Henry behind as we pursued our investigation at the house. Discovering no sign of our adversary but finding Mrs. Dew Stapleton tied and mistreated in a room, she revealed her husband's hideout, an old tin mine in the heart of the mire. As the fog thickened, Holmes realized the impossibility of navigating the mire that night, while Mrs. Stapleton, with fierce merriment, hinted at the peril her husband faced alone in the Grimpen mire. Realizing all efforts futile until the fog cleared, Holmes the baronet and I returned to Baskerville Hall, leaving Lestrade with the estate. The revelations about the Stapletons struck deep, leaving Sir Henry feverishly delirious. The fog's lift the next day offered path through the morass, revealing the tragedies and secrets Stapleton concealed, including Sir Henry's boot and the remains of the hound and its victims. Evidence of a desperate flight and a hidden life in the bog surrounded us, yet Stapleton's own fate, presumed swallowed by the mire, remained a harrowing mystery we could only surmise. The saga, fraught with danger and cunning, concluded with the morass claiming its last villain, veiling his end in its treacherous depths. On a raw, foggy November night, Holmes and I dissected his recent successful cases by our Baker Street fire. The discussion naturally drifted to the Baskerville mystery, prompted by a recent visit from Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer. Holmes outlined Stapleton's plot, from his real identity as a Baskerville and escapee from South America, to his scheming to inherit through murder, leveraging the legend of the family hound to target Sir Charles. Stapleton's intricate plan, obscured initially by our lack of insight into his motives, unfolded with clarity as Holmes had pieced together the web of deceit, murder, and attempted usurpation of the Baskerville estate. In a cunning scheme, Stapleton acquires a savage hound and uses secret methods to make it appear demonic, aiming to scare Sir Charles Baskerville to death. Despite setbacks, including his wife's refusal to participate and difficulties making Sir Charles venture outdoors at night, Stapleton manipulates Mrs. Laura Lyons to lure Sir Charles out. On the fatal night, Stapleton unleashes the painted beast, causing Sir Charles's death from a heart attack in fear. The case puzzles authorities and ultimately draws our attention, revealing Stapleton's devilish ingenuity, yet leaving him with unresolved challenges, especially with the arrival of Henry Baskerville from Canada. Stapleton needed an article of Sir Henry's clothing for his hound to track him, illustrating his cunning and dangerous nature. Our investigations revealed Stapleton's criminal activities extended beyond the Baskerville case, hinting at his desperation and resourcefulness. His confidant, an old man's servant named Anthony, likely cared for the hound during Stapleton's absence. My covert operations involved staying secretly in Devonshire, supported by Cartwright for necessities, while keeping watch over Stapleton and gathering crucial information. This case was intertwined with the mysteries of the escaped convict and the Barrymores, which we managed to unravel through keen observation and deduction. On the moor, I had pieced together the entirety of Stapleton's grim plot, but lacked the concrete evidence for a criminal case. Our strategy involved using Sir Henry as unwitting bait, exposing him to grave danger to catch Stapleton in the act. This led to a traumatic but temporary impact on Sir Henry, emotionally scarred by the betrayal of a woman he loved, believed to be Stapleton's sister. She, under Stapleton's manipulative control, fluctuated between fear and loyalty until choosing to defy him at a critical moment, revealing the depths of her own conflicted feelings. Despite her efforts to warn Sir Henry and her eventual betrayal of Stapleton, the plot's unraveling hinged on our intervention. Stapleton's jealousy, a poorly concealed undercurrent of his plan, ultimately contributed to his undoing. The story culminates in a tense confrontation, with Stapleton's plans thwarted and justice looming, albeit at a cost to those ensnared in his schemes. His downfall was imminent, with or without our presence, driven by the fierce spirit of a wronged woman. As the case closes, the complexities of human emotions and moral choices underscore the narrative, leaving us to ponder the future repercussions for all involved.